Good morning, everybody. We've got a book this morning. We're on, uh, going to be on page 83. Um, your lesson starts on 84. And uh, we're looking at um, a new section now. We're going to look at um, truth in this, uh, in this lesson. And truth and light and darkness. And it's not that much removed from what we looked at in Daniel. But um, this is a different um, part of the story. And um, the verses are John 3. It starts with John 3, 19. And if we look at this, when we look at this story, this is the story of Jesus preaching and teaching. And this is a, um, an excerpt from his teachings to some of the Jews. And the Jews that are gathered around after Jesus has taught the Pharisees a lesson about uh, forgiveness and showed that he is the, the only one who can forgive, shown that he is the one who is willing to forgive, shown that he has the power to forgive, and um, shown to them sort of the, the nature of their sin in themselves. And uh, it's in, the, in light of that that he begins to teach, pe- teach these people about truth and, and the difference between the truth and the lie that that is out there in the world, even in his time, that he has come to to shed light on. And that's what it's all about, is is that the darkness hated the light. That's what we read in the scriptures, right? That the darkness hated the light. That's what Jesus has come to to teach these people about, is is how to love the light instead of the darkness, and that there is a light instead of the darkness. And um, that's what we're going to look at today. And, And these people that were... Encountering Jesus here, these, these Pharisees and these, these Jews, they believed that they had the truth, and they believed that they could count on what they, they believed to be the truth, but it was not the truth. They were believing in a lie. And Jesus taught them what the real truth was. And that's, our lesson is, does it matter which truth I believe, right? And, and you know, the, there is no different version of the truth. There is one truth, right? And, and we can... Uh, convince ourselves of different kinds of truth, but those are just lies, because there's only one truth. So let's pray, and we'll look at at this lesson today, okay? Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the blessings that you pour out on us. We ask, Father, that you'll be with us today. Let your Spirit be among us to be our teacher. And we ask, Father, that everything that we read and that was taught here today will be exactly exactly the thing that someone here needs to hear, exactly what needs to be said, so that we can be better equipped to go out there in the world to preach your gospel, to spread your gospel, and to understand how to discern the truth from the lie and to walk in your ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's look at the first section. We're on, um, on page 84 in the book, but it's John 3 and 19. And our first section is Jesus Speaking about darkness and light, he says in verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So we have this first part here, that is Jesus' um talking to Nicodemus, and uh, Jesus is teaching this truth. And it's a good verse to start with, because this does start with the very basics, that this is, this is the condemnation, he says. But this is how a man or the woman becomes condemned before the judgment seat, and Jesus is laying it out here. This, this comes about, and Jesus tells us that not through, not through the violation of these obscure, these, these burdens of laws that the Pharisees came, came up with. This is not how condemnation comes about. Jesus tells him it's not a failure to, to hold to these laws that the Pharisees had, as they believed. It was a failure to allow God to restore the broken heart to him, the sinful heart to him. And 
the verse returns to a common theme in the Bible, and that is spiritual darkness and light. That is deception and truth. And darkness, if you look in the Bible, all throughout it, it, it talks about darkness and light. Darkness is always a symbol of sin, of ignorance, death, confusion, separation from God. If you look in Isaiah 9-2, it says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. And Matthew 4-16 says, The people which sat in darkness saw great light. To them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So this is what the darkness is. This is what it represents to us. And that's what it is, according to Jesus. But if you look also in the Bible, light always symbolizes righteousness and truth, life, knowledge, understanding and the presence of God rather than his absence. And if you look in Psalm 119, 104, it tells us this, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Amen. And Proverbs 4, 18 says, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And of course John 8, 12 says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. But we see the two opposites here. Jesus is light. Without him is darkness. So then why do we see, see this, this pronouncement that people would choose the darkness? Why would people choose this way of sinfulness, this way of ignorance, this way of of death, of confusion, of separation. Why would people choose that? Why would people love ignorance over truth? Why would people choose death over life? Why would people love wickedness over righteousness? Why would somebody make that decision? Well, we're told that uh, it's because the hearts of mankind is, and the nature of mankind is, is evil. And you look in Romans 3.10... As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You look in verse 20 of John 3 here. Tells us a little bit more about this. It says that for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. So there's the reason. The heart of man, being evil, does not want to come into the light. Right? right? To have that evil shown in the light. Exposed. Every person who does evil then hates the light. Everyone who wants to remain in, in that evil, do the things that are evil, Keep doing the things that are evil. Stay in those, those, those comforting and pleasurable things that are evil, but they hate the light. Right. Because that light shines. Not only does it disperse away the darkness that they love so much, but it shows what it was, shows the truth, shows what the lie was. And that's the contrast between the darkness and the light. And that's the same in the spiritual realm and in the human heart. And it's the condemnation then faces that those who choose darkness in the face of the gospel, which is the gospel of truth and the light, denying the word of truth, they blaspheme the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Ghost. And that's, a re that's a rejection of God's truth and his righteousness. And there is no forgiveness for them then because they have no cleansing from sin. There's only wrath, separation, and torment, all the things we talked about, the darkness, And more darkness than they could have ever desired in their darkness and all those evil ways. And Romans 2, 5 through 8 says that. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, 
But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. And that's where men are condemned, because the light has come, and that is Christ Jesus. But many, still many, will prefer the darkness and shun the light. And that's in John 1, 5, says, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Right? We see that as, as misunderstanding, but it also means did not partake in it, did not envelop it, did not, did not go around it and, and embrace it. That's what it is, to not comprehend it completely, is to not want to comprehend it, not want to have anything to do with it, and that's what condemns the man. Right? And that's the natural property of light, is that it, it makes things clear. Right? It makes every evil thought, evil deed, and everybody that loves them wants to be hidden. They don't want to be exposed by the light. They want to stay in the evil and the darkness. You look in Isaiah 29, 15, it says, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? See, they like it, don't they? And Psalm 82, 5 says, They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. So all of these, these souls that are walking and living in darkness, they, 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 they are doing all of these sinful things, and that's, that's, that's you and me without the grace of God, right? They, they, they corrupt the world with sin. That's why the world is broken. We have destroyed it with sin. And it says here that, that the foundations of the earth are out of course. That's because of sin has disrupted it and destroyed it. That's the natural man or woman that is lost in the Adam nature, that fallen state, they avoid the light because they don't want those sinful actions to be exposed. They don't want them to be corrected. And that's the rejection of God's truth and his righteousness. And it's, you know, they, they don't want to give it up. Job 24, 13 says, They are of those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the paths thereof. They are ignorant, unwise, unwilling to learn or be taught. And we see here, in Job 24, 13, rebellion. We see that all throughout the Bible, the sin of rebellion against God. And they do not want to hear the truth of the gospel. They don't want to see the truth of the light. They don't want to listen to the things that Jesus teaches because while they cannot deny the truth of it, they just don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear knowing that it is true, being able to sense the truth of it in fact, it is the truth of it that they don't want to hear, right? If they, if they believed it was a lie, they would be willing to listen to it. People listen to all sorts of lies, don't they? If you look in um, Isaiah 30, 10, he, he talks about this as well. Which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. So there he's talking about these people who want, this, want the prophets to shut up. Not shut up about things they don't believe, but things that they affirm to be true. Right. Things that they know to be true. And he says, speak to us smooth things, deceits and lies. The darkness gives comfort to them and they cling to it. Not knowing that it's a false reality. That, that the light that reveals, also convicts and makes you uncomfortable with sin, and you will seek out that light. You will seek out the Christ and, and a, a revelation of his glory and his greatness. But those who are evil are resistant to that. They don't want to confront it. Um, and, and in Psalm 36, 1 says, The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flattereth himself in his own eyes. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He had left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. So that's in contrast to those who do what is true and right and do come to the light willingly. They are willing to expose themselves to the truth and live according to God's righteousness. Right? When you come to the altar and you believe on Jesus Christ, well, that's the only part of it, isn't it? You must also confess. Right? You must have your sins put to the light. And you must confess, I am a sinner, and I, I do have these dark things about myself. I'm willing to have that come into the light of Christ and have Christ take those sins off me, right. to die for my sins. Not to, not to die because I am perfect, 
but because I am sinful. Right? Jesus didn't say, you know, I didn't come because you were all perfect. He wouldn't have to do anything then. He came because we all have sins and dark things that brought that we bring into the light, bring into his light. And verse 21 says, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So it is a good thing to come to the light, even with sins and, and foul deeds upon you, because you want to come to the light, to come to the light and have those things shown. And then once you've come to the light, now we walk in righteousness, now we want the light to shine on us, right? We do righteous things, now we want the light to shine on us, don't we? Right? And not to light shine on us so that you can say, wow, what a great guy he is, no. <laughs> but so that you can, people will see who my father is Amen. and see the righteous things that he has done for me. And that shows in, in the things that I do are, just, are to point to the cross and point to the things that he has done for me. And that's what the light should do in every Christian is that it should point to the cross and point to Jesus Christ and bring people to the cross in that way. And Ephesians 5, 8 says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, reprove them. So the redeemed people of God are no less sinful than lost people. No more righteous on our own than lost people. And no more light in us than somebody who is in darkness. Well, we have, the only light that we have is the light of the Lord. Our actions are a manifestation of faith and obedience in God. And a sign of a reunion with him because of Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. And our actions are then a manifestation of faith and obedience in God. And anything righteous that we do comes from that. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify who? Me? Your Father in heaven, it says. Glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's what this is all about. And then if you look further on, we're looking in the, the next section is John 8, 31, 32. And this is the encounter that Jesus has with some of the Jews, the Pharisees, and some other Jews. <laughs> who confront him. He says in, uh, this is uh, John eight thirty one and uh, 32. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Verse 31 says, sets the scene here, Jesus speaking to the Jews. But he's not just talking to any Jews that are here, right? It says those Jews which believed on him. Right. So these are Jews who believed on him. These are people who believed what he said, right? So why does he chastise these people that believed on him? Well, we see that that answer is in what he says when he continues on. He warns these people, you have to continue in my word. You have to continue in what I say. You can be certain to then be disciples. All right? So the implication then is that some of them are, are not disciples. Right? Believers, but not disciples. Now I've seen, I've seen two different interpretations of this. And I, I lean toward one, but I'm going to go through both of them just so you guys can, you can decide what you think. Now the first one is that Jesus is seeing here that many people are making a false confession of belief. Right? And leading to some kind of temporary false profession of belief. Right? And these people, these are people that are probably, in this case, confessing out of some kind of emotional experience. They are, they are feeling joyful, and they are con confessing belief out of joy. And conviction of the Spirit is not upon them in that case, if that's the case. Right? Remember which comes first and which is supreme. Now, the conviction of the Spirit is different from an emotional high, right? And you can, you can um, if you're not careful, sometimes you will, con you will conflate the two. You will mistake the two. Uh, an emotional high, a joyfulness, 
that you get from hearing the Word of God or being in church, a church service, and the, you'll sort of get caught up in the joy of it, and you'll think this is, a, a, this is the, the moving of the Holy Spirit. Not necessarily. Joyfulness is different from the moving of the Holy Spirit. That's an emotion. Joy is an emotion. Right? And the reason we get mixed up is that the, when the Holy Spirit moves, you, joy will come right after that most of the time. Right? That's why sometimes you do get mixed up about that. It's the same thing that the conviction of the Holy Spirit will sometimes bring you into um, uh, an emotional low. <laughs> but it's not the emotional low that brings the Spirit to you. It's, it's the other thing. The one comes before the other. And one is supreme before the other. And that's something that um, we have to watch out for. And not confess because of an emotional experience, but confess because the Spirit is on you. And Spirit is drawing you, not that we are feeling good at the time. We want to feel uh, good. That we, want to, we like the songs in church. We like, we like the, the feeling of being in church. No, we want to be saved by Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the reason. We are drawn by the Spirit. Right? And that is... The, the thing that we have to be drawn by. And this is something that the old, the old pagan religions, they had to contend with this because um, when they abandoned God, their societies, and they, they started inventing these, these religions with all of these gods, they came up with gods for every different aspect of life. There's a god of justice. There's a god, god of uh, trade. There's a god of uh, goddess of love. And um, they had to contend with the, the problem that, well, because the gods were basically just people, um, they fell in love. So how do we solve for the problem that, how does the goddess of love not rule over everybody? Because she would control all of the other gods, because the emotion of love, all the gods felt that. And they came up with all these strange ways of mytho mythologies trying to explain how does the goddess of love not win over all the other gods in these, in these strange mythologies they had. And that's because of this same problem that some other people, even today, get caught up in. That um, the, uh, the, actual, the act of love, the, the, the love of God, the act of Choosing love is what God is all about. God chooses to love, right? God is not bound by love. God chooses to love. Now, he does feel love. He feels that emotion, but he's not ruled by it. God chooses to love. And we can see that in the things that he commands us to, to do. Doesn't God ask us to do loving things when we don't feel loving? Right? God asks us to choose to love as he chooses to love. And that's what the love of God is. God's not bound or controlled by love. That's what charity is. It's choosing to love and you're not being loved. Or when you don't expect to be loved back. And when you're not feeling loving at that moment. But you still do the loving thing. That's what it is. And he commands us to do the same. Right? And that's why, that's why he's trying to teach us in that time. Like, it is, it's not the emotion that should lead the things of God. It is, it is the righteousness of the things of God that lead, and the emotion will come after that. Right? So, so some of these people, it may have been, were making a false confession of belief. And we know that this is possible. This is in Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And John 6, 64 says, But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Right? But then if you look at the other perspective, the Bible does call these people that believed. Right? We don't have any other, any other description of these people except these are people that believed. So these people, I think if we look at it, actual believers, people that did believe. So these people, you can see as people who are saved, but people that Fall away. They get lost. They backslide. 
They lose their way because they do not abide in the Lord, do not abide in the Word. They stop reading the Bible. They stop going to church. They do not, they do not leave the Lord's grace, but they enjoy none of the fruits of it. They'll be chastised for it, in, in fact, and chased by the Holy, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. You know, we call him the Holy Ghost because if, you, if he really indwells into you and you depart from the ways of God, he will haunt you and chase you. <laughs> doesn't give you up. So likewise, you know, if, if you're still a believer, you can be a believer. But Jesus says, you may not be a disciple. Ready to learn, willing to learn, ready to, to, to go at his feet and, and listen to what he has to say. You can do that. It's in Luke 14, 33. It says, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So can you be saved if you have not reached that level of dedication that you're willing to forsake everything of the world? Can you be saved? I hope so. Because we still get entangled with the world, don't we? If we are still saved. In fact, when you're a young Christian, you're going to have to grow spiritually into this place where you can be fully a disciple, a true and correct discipleship. And this is what Jesus talked about. You can tread water and you can never enjoy a freedom with Christ. You can never have an enjoyment of it. You can learn nothing from him and still make the kingdom, but he warns us against doing that. And Paul talks about that too. He says, you'll, you'll go into heaven and like you escape through a fire. Your eyebrows are burned off. This is what Jesus is talking about. We cheat ourselves. We harm ourselves. We will grieve the Holy Spirit that indwells, right? You can grieve the Spirit of God. That means that he is there, but you're grieving him. And that's in Ephesians 4, 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, that that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So these two things, these two perspectives are, I think, the chief interpretations of, of what Jesus is saying here. And I, I like, I think the second one is better, but uh, I don't know, read it and see. Tell me what you guys think. Uh, verse 32 then says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus promises that, that those who continue in his word, then, those are the people, regardless, who become his disciples, right? Who know the truth. And the truth is not just intellectual truth, intellectual knowledge, deep understanding and experiential knowledge of God's truth. And John, John 14, 6 says it. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So knowing the truth involves knowing Jesus. Right? You can't know any truth but that you know Jesus. And that brings knowledge of yourself spiritually and of your spiritual state. And 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says this, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves? Know that how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? So you don't need to um, go and prove your faith to Jesus. Jesus already knows whether you have faith or not. What we, what we are given is a way for us to prove to ourselves how our faith is doing. And he gives us tools to prove our faith to ourselves. Now, Jesus wants us to be faithful, right? But Jesus wants us, gives us the tools to make ourselves more faithful to him. And it's not a mystery to God how powerful your faith is at any moment, but God does want you to be more faithful every moment. And that is to walk more in the truth every day. That's what discipleship is, to keep learning, to keep growing in the truth. And it's a freedom, it's not a political or worldly freedom. It's not a spiritual, it's not a worldly freedom. It is a spiritual freedom. It's a liberation from sin and the consequences of sin. That's through Jesus Christ. And the, the truth of, of what Jesus brings is that he sets you free from the bondage of sin and guilt and condemnation and all of that. And allows believers to live in obedience to God's will and experience true joy and abundance. And that's what we're promised. And so when Jesus is speaking to these, these Jews here, he's talking about this kind of liberation. If you look in the last part, John 8, 33 through 36, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed and never, were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? 
Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth forever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So in verse 33, they didn't have an understanding of, of what was going on, and, and the Jews who were gathered there objected to Jesus' characterization of them as being enslaved and not free. And they denied that they are in bondage or ever were in bondage. They forgot, I guess, that they throughout their whole history were in bondage. Bondage to Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece even, and now Rome had them in bondage. But Jesus, he spoke about a, a worse bondage than that. Right? He spoke about a bondage that you carry around with you. You come about a bondage from from some nation, from some state, and still carry the bondage to sin with you. And it could be that some of the Jews actually did understand this when he spoke to them about it, and maybe that's what they meant when they said, we are of Abraham's seed. Maybe they meant we have a covenant with God. We are, we're the Jews. We're the chosen people. We can't be in bondage to sin. God's, we, have, we have a covenant with God. We, we're home free already. Our lineage has made us sinless. makes us automatically saved. Right? And they're probably Jews today that still believe that. But it's been made clear through the scriptures that the true seed of Abraham is not the lineage, the physical seed of Abraham. It's the spiritual seed of Abraham, that is, Christ. It's in Galatians 4, 16. Now to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made. He saith not unto his seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto his seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. It's worth repeating that Paul's making the, the uh, distinction here. There is only one seed of Abraham, that is Christ. And everyone who is of Christ is a child of Abraham, a spiritual child of Abraham. And of course we know what Jesus has taught us about the supremacy of the spirit over the physical, don't we? So those who are children of Abraham by physical lineage and those who are children of Abraham by the Spirit, we know who the true children of Abraham are. They are those who are his children by the Spirit, by Christ, right? And any Jew who is a physical child of Abraham by, by lineage and by descendancy, you can still be a child of Abraham by the Spirit. You just have to accept Jesus Christ. That's what will save you. But not being descended from, from Abraham by lineage, that will not save you. And so Jesus tells him, yeah, uh, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. So he says, yeah, you actually are servants and slaves. He corrects them. You continue to sin against God, and when you make yourself a slave to sin by committing sin, there you go. You're giving your will over to a master. And the Bible makes plain, everybody in the world, you're going to be a servant to somebody. You're going to have a master. You're going to give your will over to a master. And Matthew 6.24 says it very plainly, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So the difference is whether you choose to serve, be a servant of sin. Bind your will to Satan, and he'll make you his slave, and you will dwell in his house. Right. Or you'll bind your will to Jesus Christ, who will free you from being a slave to Satan, give you entry into his house, and you will dwell in his house in glory, and your will will naturally, easily, and forever be pointed in his direction. And that's what it is to be a slave to Satan, or a servant of love, servant to Christ. And it's in Romans 6.14 that we see, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. This is directly of talking to these Jews, what they are, they are mistaken about. If you look in Romans 6.16, it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, 
but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So there it goes, being saved from sin, you become the servant of righteousness. You will have master. You cannot make no choice. You will choose. Right? And that's that's one thing that we we sort of look at the horror of, of slavery that, that has that has that mankind has brought upon the world. That is that is taking the will of somebody else and, and forcefully taking hold of it against their will. And, and the forcible subjection of the will of a person to somebody else, to some other man, that's probably the most horrible thing you could do to a person, really. One of the most horrible things you could do, the worst violation you could do to a person. right? But there's a different way, a different way to, to submit your will to somebody else, and that's willingly submitting your will to someone else, to actually to someone who's deserving, and there is no man that's deserving of submitting your will to. But Jesus Christ is worthy of submitting your will to. But see, that's the difference. Jesus Christ will not forcibly make you submit your will to him. We will willingly make ourselves a servant to whatever we decide to. And we do it all the time. Smoking, drinking, drugs, food, money. We give our will away to things all the time, don't we? And it becomes our master. This is why you see a distinction in the Bible between a servant who willingly puts himself into bondage and a slave who is taken into bondage. And that's why sin is shown to be so often depicted as taking you as slave. Because you will fall down in there and it will take hold of you. And you're shown as being servant, as being to give yourself over to Christ, you're then a servant. Not a slave, not taken, but giving yourself over. And, and if you look in the Old Testament under the Mosaic laws, they had a way uh, for people to be servants. And if you look at all the parables, it talks about you know, a master and a servant. They had a way for you to, if you had a great debt, you could sell yourself as a servant to a master. But you had all these rights under the Mosaic law that God said, like, you're not going to have slaves that you just abuse and throw around. You can't, you're not going to do that. It's a different relationship to, to willingly subject yourself to, some, to someone else and to be taken up by them. That's the difference. And so when we're looking at these things, these, these, these Jews here, Jesus is making it clear to them, you have made yourselves servants to a master, and you will live in your master's house. Look in verse 35. The servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. So if you're a son of Abraham by birth, that's given you a privilege already because you are here listening to Jesus, the Messiah. That's a privilege for them. But Hebrews 9.27 says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Right? That says, to every man. Appointed once to die, but after this the judgment. It's not if you have this particular lineage, you can have a, if there's a way station for you. Matthew 8, 11 says, And this I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says it right there. There's going to be plenty of descendants of Abraham, physical descendants of Abraham, who will not sit down at the table with God and Christ at the end. And there will be plenty of people who are as far away from Abraham by, by birth as it could be, that will be there. And Jesus says finally in verse 36 there, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And he's talking about, make sure that you hear this, that the freedom that Jesus offers, that is exactly the opposite of the self-delusion and the ignorance and the, the, the lying to yourself that they were doing. The belief in freedom that isn't real and, and the, that that hope for freedom that they have, that they want, that they, but that they do not have, that freedom is here. That freedom is existing. You can take hold of that freedom now. It would be sealed by the Holy Spirit for you. And Romans 6.22 says it, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Being so freed, then we have to continue then in Jesus and abide in his word. And not go back to old masters and be creeping around the old slave pens and going around to the old places. 
Because there's no place for the redeemed there. You'd be out of place there. You look like a fool going to those old places. People, people there will, will wonder why you're there, won't they? He says in Galatians 5, 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's what he's talking about. That's discipleship. Don't go back. Go forward. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. That is the true freedom. That's not the freedom that these people imagined they were in. It's this automatic freedom that they got through, through being children of Abraham. This is the true freedom. The freedom that, that he talks about when he says, you will be free indeed. Free indeed. Not, not free in deception, but free indeed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the ability to gather together. And we, we thank you, Father, for the freedom to come and worship you, Father. We, we thank you, God, that you have freed us from sin, freed us from the bondage and slavery of the devil. We ask you, Father, that you will be with us this day throughout the service. Bring to us a great inspiration. Be with the Brother Bill as he brings the message. Be with our song leaders as we praise you in song as you so deserve. And we ask, Father, that you will... Just lift us up, everyone that is sick who could be with us today. We ask, Father, that you will you will have your spirit visit them, have them lifted up and healed. Whatever needs to be done, Father, we trust in you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.